I've been celebrating the start of spring in the gardens here at the Heidi Museum of Modern Art. And this year, I've decided to bring a friend along, and I think you're going to recognise him. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Can't hide from me, Costa. Not at all. And I'm so excited to be spending a day with you in this magnificent garden. It is a magnificent garden. You will be delighted by the trees and the history. It's all good. The history is something I really want to learn about. Yeah. And I heard there's also been some changes. There have been, and it's all looking really splendid on a day, a beautiful day like this. It's perfect. Picture perfect. The Heidi Museum of Modern Art began life in the 1930s when John and Sunday Reed had a vision to create a home for the emerging modernist artists of the day. Known back then simply as Heidi, head gardener Dave Murphy explains the history of the site. Before Heidi became a museum, what was here? This was a rundown dairy farm and market garden and John and Sunday Reed purchased this property in 1934 and they were both art patrons and so their idea was to create a kind of artist's haven uh, to support burgeoning artists, um, particularly in modern art. So a colony of contemporary artists like who? For example, Sidney Nolan, Joy Hester, uh, Albert Tucker, these sort of artists. People right up there, wow. Definitely. And, and Sunday was a great gardener. Yeah, out of John and Sunday, Sunday was probably the main uh, gardener and she uh, was actually on a particular diet for medical reasons. So one of the big motivations for them having a kitchen garden was that she could have fresh leafy greens. She was a vegetarian and John was really the tree guy. So he planted a lot of the trees at Heidi. In the last few years, we've had a healing garden built near the Heidi Cottage in what was once a part of the original kitchen garden. And we've also got a native revegetation program called Gallic Langa uh, down by the river's edge in the bottom part of the property. And that's done in consultation with the Wurundjeri Corporation. While Jane heads off to explore the healing garden, I'm meeting up with Wurundjeri elder, Uncle Dave Wandon. So Uncle Dave, how did you get involved with Heidi? Heidi realised the importance, it's historical importance to you know, the modern Melbourne as we know it today. But they started to ask the questions, you know, how did my people live here on this land before? They engaged with a landscape architect to help them uh, plant an area that was more focused on Indigenous nature. So that architect then got involved with Wurundjeri Tribe Land Council, who I work for, and engaged with a whole heap of elders as to what we would like to see here so that we could come down here and celebrate the Yarra the way that our ancestors used to do. So how exactly did you start the process? I started to listen to the country and look at it seeing the low spots, their potential. We want to get people to have a much bigger experience when they come to Heidi. Get people into an Aboriginal space and experience that they're in a different part of country. You know, they're out of the modern world. So that's where we come up with the scar tree idea. So what's the significance of scar trees? We hold scar trees very, very close to our hearts and to our spirit because they are actually a part of our songline or our travelling routes, for, to explain it better. It took me a long time to understand song lines, because I'm not a singer. But delving into our history, I know that we used to sing country. At the top of the hill up here at Heidi, there is a massive old gum tree. It's probably five, 600 years old, and there is a huge scar in it, which tells us that this was a gathering place and if you come down the hill, you're going to come to big water, which is the Yarra behind us. And there, there, would normally, there would normally be food here. There would be kangaroo and there would be food in the ground. There'd be fruits on the trees and all that kind of thing. And there'd be dry areas where you could camp, places where you could wash and fish and do a whole range of activities. But they're all old. 
They're all pre-colonisation. Um, and I don't believe our culture is dead. It, it's alive, but we don't get to practise it. So what I do is a signboard for our people from other mobs that might be walking through this country. They, they could be walking through Heidi Museum, come down for a visit, come down for a walk to the Yarra, and they'll come up here and they'll be looking around, they'll see the scar trees and they go, oh, oh, the local mob here, they're still living. You know, they're still practising their culture. While Costa's been chatting with Uncle Dave, I've been making my way to the new healing garden here at Heidi, where landscape architect Liz Herbert has been responsible for the design. Liz, what was the inspiration to restore this whole area? So Sunday wanted, always wanted this space to be public. This was the original kitchen garden and it fell into disrepair. And we came in to assess what was here, it was not irrigated, it was full of ivy. Um, and think about how we could create a space that embraced everyone and brought in all characteristics of the, the greater Heidi. So what makes a healing garden? So for us, the healing garden was having a space that allowed people to come find respite to sit. So we had to find places for sitting because it's a working, it was a working space. So we've made new little pockets. The layout is the original kitchen garden layout. So that's heritage listed. We've worked within that and we've just created smaller spaces and tucked things in. So as a therapeutic garden, does it depend on fragrant plants at all or fragrant leafed plants? Absolutely, we've got, we've got a range of different spaces within this healing garden. We've built a, a meadow of soft, moving, flowers, we've got scented entries. So that experience of when you walk into this space, it's not just about what you see, it's about what you smell. And so there's this moment of pure joy of, uh, of scent. Sunday Reed loved roses and you've incorporated oh, yes. that into your plan, but you also like birds and wildlife and you can hear the bird life, it's amazing. Yeah, the birds are beautiful. And when we built the water feature, uh, over in the haptic play area, that has just increased the bird life. They all come into the mulberry tree and duck down and splash around. Did Sunday have any colour scheme in mind? Her favourite colour was sky blue. So we've taken that, the forget-me-nots she planted, they're still here. Uh, the irises were hers as well. Uh, that beautiful light pale purple colour. So we've taken that through the garden as a thematic. You've worked with the legacy of Sunday and John Reed. How's that going to work out for the future? Well, the future is to just keep evolving and experimenting. We've never wanted to recreate what was here. We don't think that Sunday would want us to do that. Uh, we're just working with her philosophy of interested in plants. We're always putting new things in. So we're going to keep using it as that experimental space. Jane, this is such a special place with a real connection to the land. And it's not only the history, but it's also the newly developed areas that are so good too. Yeah, well, I reckon we give it a year or so and then uh, come back and see how it's all progressed. You're my kind of man. I'm going to bring the picnic basket. All right, what about scones? I'll bring asparagus rolls. Cucumber sandwiches. Oh, Tim Tam biscuits. Curried egg sandwiches. Oh, lovely. Now we're talking. <laughs> Thank you.